Hello, everybody, and welcome to Pre-Health Shadowing. We're going to get started here in a minute. Thank you for joining us today. Okay, everybody, thank you for coming to our live session. Um, I'm going to be going over a quick startup presentation to introduce you guys to the program if you haven't seen it, if you haven't been here before. Um, but yeah, so let's get started. Um, so pre health Shadowing is an international student-led, minority-led, woman-led nonprofit organization that is dedicated to helping students from all over the world um, find medical, find ways to get involved in the medical field and also access resources. Um, my name is Astra Castro and I am the Chief of Diversity for pre health Shadowing and I'm so glad to have you all here today. So let's get started. Um, just a little PSA, we do have closed captioning for all of our sessions to accommodate students with disabilities. Um, the setting is available at the bottom of your Zoom screen and if you need assistance enabling the live transcript, please direct message one of our team members or myself and we can help you out with that. Um, we are always looking to be more inclusive and so if you ever have, if you have any ideas about how we can achieve that, please email us at info at prehealthshadowing.com. So we're going to start off today with a special raffle. Um, if you've been following us on social media, then you know we've been in collaboration with the Fem Health Summit. And this is a year long event featuring professionals who are also incredibly successful businesswomen and owners of their own practices. This is an incredible opportunity to um, get involved and get connected with some pretty inspirational mentors. So if you want in on this, just for this session only, we are going to be raffling off some of the tickets. Um, normally, they are $49 a ticket, and this is a year-long program, which involves um, getting to hear from various professionals and interacting with them and getting to, into different opportunities. But if you enter our raffle today, it is only $3 and per, per entry, and you can just send that money via PayPal or our Venmo. You can have the opportunity to get one of our free spots for it. So we are offering this, again, just for today but this will be open throughout the session. So go ahead and get involved with that. Leave that up for a few more seconds, but if you do need the information again, go ahead and direct message me or one of our uh, team members. So since this is an international program, we want to know where are you Zooming from? So please drop it in the chat. Awesome. Oh my gosh, we've got so many different places. El Salvador, Canada, Toronto, Ecuador. Oh my gosh, this is so, so cool. Thank you for joining us today, guys. So um, if you want to stay in the loop, be sure to follow us on social media. We are active on Instagram and TikTok. Um, and you can also sign up for our email list on our website to make sure you never miss a second. So we have a few amazing opportunities for you guys as being a part of Prehealth Shadowing. So first off, we have partnered with Kaplan to get you guys a 10% discount code that you can use on all Kaplan products, as well as free resources, such as study guides to help you prepare for all, any of the standardized tests, such as the MCAT, the NCLEX, the PCAT, the GRE. If you fill out the short survey that was just thrown in the chat, you can get hooked up with some of this. So it's a great opportunity and I recommend checking it out. Um, we would also like to draw your attention to another amazing program, which is Neolis. Neolis is an online mental health platform that for students, um, college and young adulthood is stressful enough as it is during non-pandemic times, and especially for pre-health students. So we know this path that we've all chosen isn't easy, and that's why we've partnered with Neolis to give you guys act free access to their services. If you use the link in the chat or enter the code prehealth when signing up for Neolis, you can get access to this amazing platform. So another partnership is Mask for Mask. Mask for Mask is an amazing woman-led organization that donates four masks for every four masks sold. Um, this is incredibly important during the pandemic and these masks are going towards people in the homeless community, healthcare workers that are struggling with MSPPE and others that are just need to stay safe in a time like this. So if you use our discount code PHS15, you get 15% off um, at checkout. And also 10% of the proceeds will go to 
DHS and keep our program running, which is amazing because we are a nonprofit that works that runs solely off of the support and work of our students. So if you would like to play a bigger part in supporting our organization, um, you can become a volunteer with us or you can even become a team member. Um, you can apply today on our website for either of those opportunities um, and you can get involved with initiatives such as professional outreach, grant writing, and more. Um, we know that as pre students, we don't always have a ton of time. So if you just want to, you just have a few spare hours. Um, being a volunteer, you can get certified volunteer hours with us and do asynchronous tasks whenever you can. If you are a high school student and want to get involved, we are, have just launched a program called HCP, which is High School Training for Pre-Health Shadowing. And it allows you to connect with pre-college programs um, and get involved in fundraising for PHS and organize resources for other high school students who are also interested in medicine through pre-health shadowing. So if you want to get involved with that, be sure to also sign up as a volunteer and indicate that you are interested in HTP. Um, we want to recognize the work of all of our students in the program. So if you are interested in getting published, you can submit essays, reflections, research papers, and reviews to our editor-in-chief who is here with us today, Asim Saha. Um, and you can get published on our website. It's a great thing to advertise on your CVs, your resumes, your applications, and so I would definitely take advantage of this. So um, we would like to bring attention to something else. Um, we have a part of the diversity program here at Free House Shadowing. We are looking to host monthly diversity workshops. And so if you want to get involved and you want to nominate professionals that you think should be speaking at these panels, um, please go ahead and drop their name in the survey that was just linked in the chat. And you can help, you can see somebody that inspires you um, up on one of our panels. For next month, we will be hosting one, especially for Women's History Month. And that is super exciting. And I look forward to seeing you guys there at that. So if you know any women professionals that you think will have some great insight, please recommend them to us and we would love to help them. So if you can, we humbly ask that you donate to our program. As I've said, pre health Shadowing is a completely student-run organization and we are working around the clock and around the world <laughs> to keep this up and accessible for everyone. Unfortunately though, Zoom and our website are not free. So any contribution you can make would be greatly appreciated. If you are not financially able, we completely understand, but we do request that you send this link to someone who you think might be able to contribute and support this program to support all students who might not be able to afford similar opportunities. Um, throughout the session today, we encourage you to drop any questions you have for the speaker in the chat and our team members will be making note of these to ask in the later half of the session. That said, be sure to take good notes and we encourage you to um, ask good questions because there will be a chance to earn a virtual shadowing certificate that verifies the hours that you spend at our session today. Um, and you can do this through taking a post-shadowing assessment. There will be more information on this at the end of the session as I give a short wrap-up presentation, so stay tuned. Um, so I appreciate you all listening to my spiel. Now, um, if you can, please put your cameras on. It makes it feel a little more connected and more personal as we're here today. But if you can't, we understand. And otherwise, I hope you enjoy the session. So. Thank you, and I would like to welcome um, our professionals today. Um, you can go ahead and start sharing your screen and read the chance. Thank you. Okay. Are you seeing the screen just fine? Yes. Yes, yes it's perfect. Thank you. Uh, should I go ahead? Yeah, go ahead and get started. All righty. Um, all right. So um, what I was sort of uh, asked was we'll kind of talk for maybe 15 minutes or so about, you know, what it is that I do and um, how I got there. Um, one thing, uh, bear with me for a second. The um, uh, Sorry, I'm having a slight technical thing in that the 
um, transcription is overlapping where I click a button to. Hmm. A few more seconds that I should be okay. Okay, there we go. All right. So anyway, um, what do I do? So I'm involved in anesthesiology. I'm an anesthesiologist, but I don't take care of patients anymore. And um, the areas of anesthesia that I work with are in the operating rooms. And then to some extent, occasionally in terms of chronic pain medicine. Um, I do a lot of administration work, um, but, and principally what I'm doing is analytics. So I'm doing work with statistics and industrial engineering, management science, um, quite a lot of computer programming um, typically. And I teach. So um, for example, for the past uh, four days, I was teaching a group of uh, five people. Um, the, typically my courses are remote and five is a typical number. And these are people in their upper thirties to fifties who take a course 12 hours a day for four days. The people are taking time off from their clinical jobs. And so that's kind of how they like doing it. Um, again, sorry, I can't change the slides because of the transcription. There we go, All right? So um, what do um, anesthesiologists uh, do? So uh, there is a wide range of activities. They're involved in operating room cases, uh, taking care of patients in the operating room, chronic pain medicine, uh, critical care, palliative care patients, for example, hospice. There's regional anesthesia where they do like nerve blocks. There's the anesthesia for uh, neurosurgery, um, for heart surgery, pediatric surgery. And these are different types of fellowship training you do after your anesthesiology residency. So uh, people who go into um, anesthesiology, um, it's pretty much a uniform approach where first you do your undergraduate education. In Europe, it would be in some places combined with medical school. Um, you do an anesthesiology residency, and now it's very common to do at least one year of fellowship in one particular area. Um, a lot of the people who are going into academics nowadays and joining like my department have done two fellowships. So for example, I work with, um, one anesthesiologist, she became, did critical care and then spent a year with palliative care. Um, now, other people who do anesthesia, um, there's nurse anesthetists. So they do their undergraduate nursing. Um, then they do uh, work doing critical care nursing. And then they get a nursing, um, basically a doctorate in nursing practice, takes three years and become nurse anesthetists. And their anesthesiology assistants, they go um, undergraduate and then they get a master's degree. So if you wanna have opportunities to be doing many different things, and you might want to be, for example, either managing a hospital, you wanna be doing critical care, want to be working in chronic pain medicine, run an intensive care unit, probably go to medical school, become an anesthesiologist. But a lot of anesthesiologists do not take care of patients every day. And I'm an extreme example. Um, if you wanna be taking care of patients daily, um, then there's becoming a nurse anesthetist and a certified anesthesiology assistant. So um, when I was asked to go in, you know, to present um, and send slides, it was probably around January 8th and so, what I did was I just kind of wrote down what I did on that day, and it was a very typical day. Um, I don't exactly remember January 7th, but I can explain what I did. So I'm working with a group of medical students who are interested in how do people get information about if they're, um, they are planning to be or are pregnant um, during medical school or their partner is pregnant uh, during medical school. And they're interested in how to get that information um, and coordinating it. So I'm doing basically statistics and math that helps that, but it would be not possible or practical if I hadn't gone to medical school. Um, so then there is, um, I do, been, since the pandemic started, I've been managing daily, um, keeping track of the patients with COVID-19 at my hospital and how that changes the operating room schedule. 
and looking for any nosocomial spread. That means spread within the hospital uh, from, the, uh, from the virus. So um, I do work, it takes about an hour a day looking at data and basically progressively been modifying computer code for that. Um, so in our department, um, every day, um, every anesthesiologist, when they supervise nurse anesthetists, they will evaluate the nurse anesthetist. So you can think of it, yeah, they're basically they evaluate the nurse anesthetist and there's like a form that they fill out that we've shown is psychometrically reliable, meaning that it's well-developed and it's measuring the activity. So um, I basically developed the mathematics for this um, over many years have shown that it works. And um, what I was doing during that day was improving some of the techniques. We also have that every single day, every anesthesiology resident and anesthesiology fellow who works with an anesthesiologist evaluates that anesthesiologist quality of supervision. And these new statistical methods that I was working on apply equally. So that's what I was doing on that day. Um, that basically involves a lot of type computer programming with statistics and math. Okay. And I'm waiting for the transcription. Now I, oh, I can click now. So the, um, what other things did I ended up doing that day? Um, we are um, doing, doing research studies in which with patients who have COVID-19 and they have to come to the operating room using swabs and basically sampling in different locations in the operating room to learn during surgery where the virus spreads to. And um, so uh, my role was in terms of the analysis of this. And these are types of studies in which if, if it hadn't been that I'm an anesthesiologist, I would never practically be able to do the math, I don't think, because it relies on my understanding what's happening to the operating room, what are the clinical type questions. But in the same way, I have to do math. Um, and then finally, during the night, um, I was finishing up a paper in which how do we look at the uh, productivity of anesthesiologists and nurse anesthetists, the amount of work that they get done, and how does it depend on which people are assigned to work on which cases. And I'm very well known around the world in this area of measuring productivity, how to help people be able to care for more patients um, by the way that we do the staff scheduling and how we assign people to individual cases. So um, why, um, why did I, again, it, it was a, few, a while ago, but why did I say like, I like a day? I know what I enjoy doing. I like things when I'm using my clinical knowledge, um, when I'm relying on all the things that I learned in medical school and that I learned in my residency. Um, and I really like using statistics and um, engineering. Um, and that's what I learned uh, mostly in college. I learned a lot in college and a lot in graduate school. Um, and I have kept on, it's been a lot of years ago. So I keep on reading and learning more and more. Um, I like when a given day, I'm doing quite a few different projects each for a few hours and interacting with people. Um, during the pandemic, it's been mostly by um, video. And for me, actually, it's meant that I get much more work done um, than if I have to walk physically from one place uh, to another. And I really like teaching when people learn how to use these techniques that um, I've developed over the years and colleagues around the world um, have developed over the years and watching them get used is really fun. I enjoy it. So how did I um, get to um, you know, what I'm doing? So first of all, um, I went to college and um, I had really, I knew I liked math and I knew I liked biology and that's about all I knew. So um, what happened was that I began to take biology courses and taking statistics and applied mathematics courses. And I saw the same students in the same classes, basically pre-med classes and math classes. And we um, actually went to the college and they created a major for us, um, which was combined uh, degree. 
So um, that's what I did. And in terms of um, what extracurricular activities that I did, I did research. Um, I did research all throughout college. And um, one of my first projects was looking at survey science um, in terms of how you basically would analyze questions in which people might lie, um, very sensitive type uh, questions and things like that. Um, one of the things that I got very lucky was that I had an about person who um, knew I knew how to do computer programming for statistics and I was interested in biology. And even though I wanted to go to medical school, what he did, he's a, a geologist who studies fossilized pollen. And he said that it didn't matter what I did research in, the key was to work in a large research group um, that it's applying uh, mathematics to biology and it was phenomenal advice. And so um, I did work studying basically the spread of pollen, but it has enormous applications in terms of the spreads of infectious diseases. And um, so it was, it was a very, very good background. So I got a lot of practical experience in how you apply math uh, to biology. So from there, um, I uh, applied and got into the medical scientist training program. So these programs have been funded in the United States for many decades. Um, and you combine uh, medical school and uh, graduate school. Now, now it, I, what I do is what's called analytics. Some people, it's called data science. Basically analyzing large, large of that. But I had never heard any of these terms. Maybe I'm just kind of backwards. And even 10 years ago, I never heard the term. But I've been doing anti graduate school. It was biomedical engineering. But I'm kind of not like who does like not an engineer. So, but I took lots of courses in statistics, all for planning for applying things on the computer. But my interests are biology. So what were the two big steps that made a big difference in my career? College um, and went to graduate school. I was able to write a one page application and go to what was called a supercomputer center. And this was before there was the internet. Um, and basically the National Science Foundation had set up these supercomputer centers. And um, basically they're very fast computers. Now it was, however, of no practical use because without the internet, the problem was connecting to the computer was so slow. I, maybe some people know about this, but there used to be these things, these acoustic modes and you take a telephone and you put it in and it'll go rah, 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 and it'll make noises, but you would program one line at a time. And literally this is the rate at which you would, you would have a screen would refresh. So the fact that the computer is super fast would make no difference. Why did I find the supercomputer center so useful? Because um, I had just come from college and the thing was that most of the people taking the course were people in their 40s and 50s. These were experienced, you know, professors. They were signed. Watched was that we would all take classes together, and then we would have projects. And these people who were like away from their families and stuff, and their spouses were watching the kids, they would wake up early and be in the computer lab. And at the end of the day, they didn't go to a bar. They didn't go to restaurants. All they did was work. And one of the th things that I learned from that experience was it, it getting work done was, that I was so impressed by was people worked. And that is for my field. That's kind of what it takes. It, you just got to work a lot. Um, and I, I learned that lesson. It was such a good experience to be able to watch people from so many different fields and what was a common theme of getting stuff done. And then um, the next summer, um, I met my wife. 
Um, we this was before there was like the internet was just starting. There were no dating apps, but in fact, medical students in my class sent surveys out to new students, and essentially we kind of got set up just like as if it had been an app or, of some sort, and um, we started dating the next week, and we've been together ever since. So um, how did I get into um, anesthesiology? I love taking care of kids um, and uh, babies, but um, I also knew that for math and statistics and science that I needed to take care of adults and I wanted to know how to take care of adults. So I wanted a field that included both taking care of young kids and also older um, patients. And uh, that was one thing for anesthesiology. Um, another thing is um, many people who I now know very well, um, who are about maybe 10 years older than me, they were developing at the time the applications of mathematics for describing how drugs spread in the body. So the thing which is amazing about anesthesia is you turn on a vaporizer and 15 seconds later, you know, the patient's beginning to go to sleep in 15 more seconds, they're asleep. It's that fast. You give a drug, it takes 15 to 25, 30 seconds to work. So how do you mathematically represent this time course and make sure you're giving the appropriate doses of the drugs? These people were developing these techniques and I would read their papers in scientific journals and say, wow, you know, I can do that and I can do it. Um, and so that's kind of how I went into the field. So I finished my anesthesiology reticency in 1993. Um, and, um, one of the things was again, back in graduate school, I took lots of statistics, but my focus was things that were applied, you know, practical. And a lot of the things back then was for business applications. So many of the courses that I took, people would do things such as how do you, for example, study people when they line up to go into a movie theater or line up for a train or things like that. And I knew I was interested in healthcare, but they were practical things. So anyway, in 19, around, when I was finishing around 1993, um, I heard um, uh, Hillary Clinton speaking. Um, and this was when the um, uh, President Clinton was talking about uh, healthcare reform. And I was fascinated. Um, one of the things that people said was that if we took better care of the patients and prevented complications, that that would reduce healthcare costs. And I, I remember thinking to myself, you know, I think it's wonderful to prevent complications, but wonderfully, I don't have many complications. I mean, most patients do very well with surgery. And I think that of course, preventing complications is important, but I didn't understand how that would save money. And in fact, it won't. Um, so I started doing these management studies and um, then people asked me to do them more and more, and it pro has progressed now over a few decades. Um, what I had not expected, so my wife is a general thoracic surgeon. So she, that means she does um, lung cancer surgeries, patients who have infections in the chest, uh, uh, cancer of the esophagus and so forth. So we um, thought, you know, that between me doing um, anesthesiology and her doing surgery, that it would be easy to get a job. Um, and it was not so um, because I wanted to do research and um, the thoracic surgery, the lung and the soft, it's very specialized. So we tried um, and we were living apart for um, more than five years. And the problem was that like, you know, with I would did it was called liver liver transplant anesthesia. So I would be like on call waiting to do liver transplants, but then I wouldn't be doing them, but we would be apart. And um, you can see it was from 1993 to 2001, we were probably apart for um, the last five years living in different cities. And we would see each other like every other weekend. And I didn't like it. And what happened was it became harder to travel in 2001 after the terrorism attacks. And I just kind of gave up. And so I stopped taking care of patients and, um, you know, I do teaching and I do the math and statistics and I'm in the same department. I've never changed working for the university of Iowa. 
Um, I think that for me, uh, COVID-19 is going to have a, a, another very large effect. Um, one of the things was is that um, I have the skills to study in terms of pandemics and infectious disease from the time that I was you know, in uh, graduate school. The interests have been very limited and I've tried and people just have not been a big focus and that clearly has changed. And so a lot of my time, um, both day to day and in terms of research is infectious disease for anesthesia and I think that probably will never end. Um, the other thing is that the ability to work remotely has increased so much. And I think that's gonna really, really change the process of my job in the future. Where in the past, um, really for the past 15 years, I've traveled nearly 60% time going to different hospitals uh, in North America mostly, but around the world. And I'm expecting that I'll be doing virtually all the teaching and the work probably by uh, Zoom uh, more equivalent methods. So I think that my ability to do a lot more has actually expanded. And um, that's kind of what I have planned. Um, thank you so much for going over that. Um, we can definitely start some of our Q&A portions right now. Um, sorry, give me one second. Um, Muntaha, are you ready to ask some of the questions? Yes. Um, someone asked, what is your favorite medical school memory? And also, what are what is your favorite memory as an anesthesiologist? My favorite medical school memory. Um, well, it's all about the people who I met in medical school. So I would say, in terms of whether my wife, but my lab partner friends, people in graduate school, um, stuff like that. And I know that one of the things that's striking is that when I think about like all the courses that I took and things like that, ironically, the things that I mostly remember are just these few like lessons that people would talk about in terms of how they make decisions and so forth. That's mostly what I remember. So really in terms of medical school, I would say it's the people. The other thing that I really remember in terms of patients it's babies. Now, obviously I don't remember the individual babies, but I just like taking care of kids. Um, and so that's actually what I remember. And so it's kind of ironic that I can just hardly remember older patients, not that they're unimportant. I just remember in the neonatal ICUs and so forth. The other thing about medical school was that when um, during medical school is when the rate with AIDS was growing and nearly every people died. I mean, and then just so many people, you know, dying of AIDS. And I remember that and stuff like that and watching the people taking care of them and having no medicines that really would work for the diseases and so forth. Um, so the things that I really remember, I think of the patients with AIDS, who just so many people wards dying. Um, and I remember in terms of how enjoyable was taking care of babies. Um, there was another question. I'm sorry, I forget the other one. The other question asked, what are some of memorable some of your memorable experiences as an anesthesiologist? I guess I love taking care of just the, the diversity of patients that are so diverse. And I also like now that I'm since I had not taken care of patients, how in the same way the questions that arise are such diverse in terms of the spectrum. So that um, in the same time, for example, one of the things that one person is interested in, a pediatric anesthesiologist I work with is how can we be able to have women anesthesiologists who are, um, for example, pregnant, you know, have given birth in terms of, let's say, a breast milk pumping session? Um, that would be one question. Another question of a pediatric anesthesiologist from yesterday is how to plan things for babies undergoing heart surgery. But another thing was how to deal with an 80 year old patient with COVID, for example, have to go to the operating room. So the idea in terms of dealing with the physiology and the pharmacology, but also the organization through the healthcare system of people at all ages is something that I like. Um, the other thing is that I've worked with just so many great people over such a long period of time. 
you know, with, um, and that's what I really like is the people. Got it. Thank you for that insight. Um, what experiences did you have prior to um, going into medical school that maybe got you interested in statistical analysis? Was it an undergrad? Yeah. Is it your master's? It's actually high school. So I, um, what happened is the following. Um, I was from a place in Southern Rhode Island. When I was growing up, there was very few jobs, a very high unemployment rate. It had been an area with a naval base and the base closed. Um, many of the families that I went to school in were, the parents were unemployed and so far. I didn't really quite understand what was going on, but that's really the situation. And um, there just really wasn't any industry particularly, but what happened was that in uh, the ninth grade, um, one of the parents uh, came and he talked about being a microbiologist and he worked for a food and drug administration lab that was one of the, one of the, the naval base and they closed a lot of the base but the Food and Drug Administration Lab was still there. And what they did was um, shellfish sanitation. So for example, if there were cholera epidemics, outbreaks from the shellfish and things like that, they would track it. And um, it's remarkable the stuff that they let you do back decades ago. They probably shouldn't as a high school student. But um, after the summer of the ninth grade, I was working with cholera. And so, um, you know, basically I did that for um, three years. And um, one of the things was that as part of it, there are sanitation engineers. These are the engineers who plan water treatment plants. And when there are outbreaks, for example, of pathogenic E. coli uh, basically cause a severe disease, they track them down and things like that. And so what was very nice there was that not only would I work with microbiologists, but I met these sanitation engineers. I had no idea what it was, but um, there were some tests and basically they assigned me projects because I would work with like a calculator. They would have like literally, um, these are cathode ray tubes and stuff like that. But I, they gave me a project that the idea was if a test was negative at three days, that almost always would be negative at four days. And I started just reading a statistics book and they gave me books to read and so forth and um, kind of learned from there. And I, I think back in terms of what they did, it was probably a very good training because I was available basically to them. Um, and at the same time, um, I kind of learned that. And um, one of the things that I also know is in, in thinking back, they tried to explain to my parents that it made a lot of sense for me to learn how to do these things rather than say, basically I didn't have a job. So my, what I did was I would go and work in the lab and stuff like that. And that would help in terms of going to college, which it did. Cause then in college, I was able to get computer programming jobs and make more money than I would have made in high school. So I was very fortunate in that regard. So the key thing was I knew I was interested in statistics and I knew I was interested in biology when I went to college. And then the big luck, which I mentioned when I first went to college, literally my first year, I began to see people both in pre-med courses and applied math courses. And I saw the same students and I had asked people, some went into ecology, some went into genetics and different things. But um, what happened was we were just really lucky that there were enough of us that we could go to the applied math department and the biology department and at least one or two of the professors were willing to create a major. And now I know, and I think about how much work that must have been for them. It was really lucky that they were willing to take the time, you know, for us, but um, it was very good. So that was really kind of the process and stuff like that. Thank you for explaining that. It's nice to know that professors work with students like that. Um, I have no idea. I don't even remember who they are, but, you know, I know that if I could look back and say, like, you know, thank you for taking the time. You know, these things, it's so hard to know sometimes how you, you know, you do something and you teach or something like that, and then how people can, you know, use it in the future. Yeah, teachers are so important. They how are. is the experience of doing chronic pain anesthesia different from general anesthesia? You can talk about the patient experience or your experience. So I don't have, when um, I remember uh, when I did my anesthesiology residency, um, definitely you rotate in chronic pain, but it was something that I knew that I wouldn't be doing. And 
I, I mean, I learned enough because, you know, I had to, I mean, it was, you know, responsibility. It's a part of the specialty, um, but not that much. So uh, my involvement has been since in terms of the research in it and so forth. Um, I think there is a tremendous amount of overlap because everything involving anesthesiology is an integral portion in terms of taking care of patients with pain, both patients with acute pain, for example, with surgery or something like that, or trauma, but also with chronic disease. And a lot of anesthesia involves the uh, nerve blocks. So there are these interventional pain procedures that are done for patients with chronic pain. And these patients also have a lot of psychological disease, which is integrally involved in pain. Um, and so that's kind of the relationship in terms of pain management. And pain management involves psychology, involves uh, pharmacy, and involves other disciplines. You work with neurosurgeons, orthopedic surgeons, uh, physical medicine and rehabilitation, and psychiatry. So it's very multidisciplinary. Um, anesthesiology in the operating room is also very multidisciplinary because you can't do surgery without operating room nurses, surgical technologists, the environmental cleaning, the housekeepers, the infectious disease, um, all the different types of surgery and so forth. So one of the things is it's very, it's such a team activity. Well, you can see how I mentioned like doing different projects in terms of Zoom with people and things like that. It's very team oriented. So um, I guess that's kind of one of the, the common features of it. So it's not in any way sort of like a person who's working on their own, for example, in a primary care, let's say in a rural area. Um, anesthesia is kind of almost the opposite. So the, the problems we talk a lot about are interactions and in teams, how to improve the ability of teams to function. And in my own work, in terms of, let's say, research and teaching, most of the work in my course, it's not only learning in terms of vocabulary. You, unfortunately, you have to memorize a lot. There's no way around it. But it's learning how to work in teams to solve these types of math problems. So anesthesia is extremely team-oriented. Thank you. I think it's um, very important, especially now that we do recognize like there's so many different dimensions to healthcare and there's so many different workers. It's not just the doctors. It's also, um, it's also, you know, support staff, the paramedics, and all the paramedic uh, specialties in there. And, so, and one of the things I kind of emphasize is that, you know, nurse anesthesia is so phenomenal. I mean, the thing is, when you look at these people who are just such great critical care nurses and go into nurse anesthesia and the things they can do, is it's a rude in terms of taking care, you know, um, it's very, it's specific in terms of operating room anesthesia and stuff like that. And in the same way, now they have these certified anesthesiologist assistants. So there are many different routes uh, to go and each have advantages and disadvantages and different focus. Yeah, um, I think some of the questions that people had in the chat were kind of actually related to that. They were wondering, um, like, how did you end up choosing anesthesiology specifically? Was there another field you could have seen yourself in or would have considered if you were to go back to medical school now? Would you still go into the same field? Well, I know that, the, okay, when people think of engineering, they definitely focus on the idea of things that involve like, you know, radiology and stuff. The problem is that I basically was very anatomy impaired and I'm not really good at like, I know like when you have pathology to me, it was very interesting, but you look at pathologists and um, one of the things is that um, a friend of pathologist said that you can look at a picture and she said, she'll instantly tell something different in a picture. I look at a picture and I won't remember a thing. So if I walk, one of the things is I hear these stories that there are people who go into like, I don't know, spies or whatever, but you know, they can walk through a room and can immediately describe, you know, what's different in the people. I walk through a room and I don't remember a thing. So um, in the same way, if it comes to something like, what is the color of the wallpaper, something I saw, I won't even remember that there's wallpaper. So I think that that actually is really important in terms of the specialty, things such as, you know, one person was interested beforehand in dermatology. Well, I would be a poor dermatologist. Um, things that involve looking in terms of pictures and stuff like that is really not me. Um, so in terms of other fields, no, I, I, I think that in, if when looking back at it, anesthesia is probably, you know, like a, a really good choice and stuff like that. 
So, um, and I'm not really sure in terms of what I would have changed, so to speak, and stuff like that. I do think that what is really, if, if I were to do something different, I would probably, now that there is these analytics programs and there are departments that are called business analytics and um, also biostatistics programs are much more diverse. So back in the eighties, there was a sense that there really was two ways of using statistics, that there was clinical trials and there was sort of epidemiology. And so I think that biostatistics has grown to such a large extent. It's such a, statistics is such a broad field. So the, I think that if I hadn't gone to basically wouldn't be a different area of medicine per se is rather is have a PhD in biostatistics and doing that. And when you see, for example, the pandemic, imagine the people who design these clinical trials for vaccines so quickly. I mean, the level of complexity of how you are simultaneously looking at the doses of drugs and at the same time, the effect of the drugs it's amazing. It's amazing the mathematics of what is happening to make that possible. Um, and so it, it's great. It, it's a wonderful, wonderful field doing different things in biostatistics. Going off of that, how would you characterize the role of anesthesiologists as first advocates for patient safety? Um, the student was talking about how unlike public health professionals, anesthesiologists may not be in the front line, like they can't really advocate for stronger comprehensive tobacco policies or mammography screenings like other health, well, like other public I, health. I, actually, health. anesthesiologists yeah. would as a specialty, um, I, 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 okay, okay, I'm absolutely unequivocally not speaking for any organization whatsoever, but they actually do advocate for quite a bit. So the previous Surgeon General, um, you know, was an, is an anesthesiologist. Um, uh, anesthesiologists are very public focused in terms of, for example, the uh, fentanyl abuse, the whole problems with narcotics and how many people have died of this. I mean, we use uh, narcotics in the operating room, the problems with chronic pain and, and so forth. So I think there actually is a lot of advocacy for different types of issues because anesthesia involves all age groups. Um, that would be one thing. The other thing is this importance in terms of uh, chronic care and palliative care in terms of interactions with families, in terms of not trying to do unnecessary care for people, you know, in the intensive care units or that aspect. And then at one of the things about anesthesia is that you are, while the surgeons are operating and so forth, you are the patient's advocate in terms of you've got to keep the patient safe through the whole process. And so I think that there's a lot of advocacy that occurs. So yes, definitely, of course, you know, things such as preventive medicine and stuff like that is, is more but I think there's a large role in terms of anesthesia and many anesthesiologists are very focused in terms of public health type issues. And really the COVID-19 pandemic has really made a very, you know, clear in terms of uh, ventilator management, um, critical care. And, and the other thing is that when, one thing which is looking at my own department is how so many of the nurse anesthetists, not only the anesthesiologists, the nurse anesthetists given the foundation is critical care medicine, we're so much involved in terms of the um, intensive care unit patients and intubation of patients acutely in the pandemic. Thank you for sharing about that and also shedding some light on just kind of like how pandemic has specifically impacted your field and even maybe beyond your necessarily scope of practice at the moment with um, maybe not being in person with patients, but still that is really interesting to hear about how the specialty has maybe even grown in because of COVID and in the different ways that it has. Um, another question we had was, um, is in-depth knowledge about computer science required for all anesthesiologists or are no. there other maybe like subspecialties in the field we can go into? Well, first of all, most, peop most people do anesthesia or taking care of patients every day. And so, no, they're, they're not doing, you know, computer science and computer programming and things like that at all. Um, that really is related to, I would say, research and so forth. And 
I haven't taken care of patients since directly, you know, since 2001. It's been a long time. So my day-to-day -day work is doing things, basically you can describe it as statistics and uh, math and stuff like that, but not that it's not true for most anesthesiologists. Um, but anesthesia is definitely very technical. What I mean by that is you're dealing with anesthesia machines that are engineering, you're dealing with monitors. So the thing, one of the fundamental features in terms of whether it's um, nurse anesthesia, um, anesthesiologist assistants, anesthesiologists in, in the operating room is we have basically sensors. So you would have, for example, heart rate over time. You have a blood pressure over time. You have um, you know, pulse oximeter over time. So these are signals and each of them basically is signal processing. And so what uh, engineers would describe that as multivariate because there are multiple signals and all those signals are related. You also have the drugs that are being infused. So that idea of how do you deal with multiple signals simultaneously and integrate that information, that's really kind of the focus of anesthesia. And that actually is very much, you know, my background training and so forth. In the same way, for example, radiology, whatever they're dealing with images, pictures. So the, the fundamental aspect of, of anesthesia really involves your, how you integrate lots of different um, signals. It, it, it's kind of a feature in terms of the operating room anesthesia. We have had a lot of students asking about work-life balance. Do you have any tips on how to manage time so you can spend time with family and friends, like per, your personal time, and also spend time learning and working and really like uh, being in, in, into your field? Well, I would say the number one thing is, at least for myself, is do one thing at a time. There's no value in terms of texting or listening to something else or something like that. The brain doesn't work that way. So, I mean, the whole problem is, I mean, it's unfortunate that our brain only does one thing at a time, but our brain only does one thing at a time. That's how our brain works. And the, the other, I mean, it keeps us alive. But I mean, other than physiology, we are designed to do one thing at a time. And it's not that, you know, people train themselves to do more than one thing at a time. So I would say that if I, if there's anything like looking back in terms of trying to learn stuff in medical school or college, I would have learned is do one thing at a time and learn it. Okay. The second thing, which if I look back in college, I wish I kind of learned is to sleep. Um, what I mean by that is you can't learn and remember if you are tired. It doesn't work that way. And if you try to like stay up, you know, there's this vicious cycle. But the problem is that like the brain went, you, you don't remember it. So um, th those things, I mean, it sounds so basic, but I wish I had like, like listened and read the science and stuff like that. Um, the same way was if you're tired, take a nap. I know how like crazy it sounds and you can't do that when you're taking care of patients, but when you're trying to study and learn because you have to remember, it doesn't help to read something if you don't remember it. And that's, that's what, so that would be one feature. And I don't mean it in a minor way. I mean, it in a major way. So that would be one piece. Um, I don't, could you repeat? I kind of uh, lost, could you say what the other part of the question was? Sorry, I apologize. Um, that's fine. So they were asking about work-life balance as an anesthesiologist. Yeah. Do you think it, fe do you feel like the, your job? It's a chat. Yeah. So one of the things to consider about anesthesia, there's positives and there's negatives as a specialty. So one of the positives are that, um, Definitely, in, okay, I'm going to compare, for example, anesthesiology compared to my wife is a surgeon, right? So um, she gets phone calls at all times of the night and she has to go into the hospital. And the thing is that if we had, let's say, young kids, I mean, somebody else has to take care of them. I mean, there's no way that you know you can't not go into the hospital. And, and so that it's much easier in terms of anesthesia because you do know when you're going to be working and when you're not going to be working. So that's an advantage, okay? However, it is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In other words, you may know, but it's very shift oriented. In other words, and the proportion that's going to be during the nights and weekends is very high. And, and that's sort of a, a feature in terms of trying to coordinate a, and stuff like that. 
So therein lies sort of the pluses and uh, the minuses compared to you know some fields and so forth. Um, but patients need care. You know, patients have accidents and stuff like that, and that's it's an integral nature of anesthesia. Um, the other thing is that, you know, so many um, anesthesiologists, nurse anesthetists, they get their training in the military in the United States. And um, during my residency, many of the people uh, basically had, um, had medical school paid for, you know, by uh, being in the military and they were deployed afterwards. And that's an inherent nature in terms of anesthesia as well, that you're taking care of patients with accidents and war and so forth. And so it's also things to consider in terms of family life and so forth. Um, the beauty of it is you get to take care of patients when they need to receive care. Oh, thank you for giving some insight on that. As we don't talk about it enough, but work-life balance is very important. And especially since, I mean, just going into med school and having that like knowledge and preparing for that because med school is gonna be in it or any professional school is going to be very hectic, very time consuming and draining one, for young adults. One thing that we know is that um, kind of doing a, uh, my research hat for things that, you know, have been learned. There was a study that was done. Um, I had the kind of the ability to be part of it in terms of statistics was a survey, a group of anesthesiologists did of all um, women anesthesiologists in the United States. And one of the things was, was trying to understand um, women anesthesiologists who would recommend to medical students not to choose anesthesia. One of the key features was that um, the challenges for people who went into anesthesiology thinking that it would be very sort of uh, family oriented and so forth. And things learned was, is that there are so many challenges in life and it's not to wait. In other words, if a person is, let's say, in medical school or something like that, it doesn't get easier, it gets harder. And so that, you know, the thing you do is you have to kind of focus on your own lives and stuff like that. And, you know, families and spouses and boyfriends and girlfriends and all these things like that. Don't wait because it, life doesn't get easier because there are just so many more challenges and stuff like that. And the work hours don't get shorter. They get more as you go, go along. That's just the inherent nature of it. Um, one question we had was kind of related to your work with COVID. Um, student was asking, there or was saying, there is a rising number of people who have recovered from COVID that are reporting altered, altered senses of smell and other neurological problems. And then maybe perhaps something else we can consider in this question is um, the multi-inflammatory syndrome experienced by some children. Um, they were asking, how can state statistical analysis be used to gain more information about um, what is causing these phenomena? Yeah, I don't really know anything about it, unfortunately. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I, I just don't know enough to um, say. Um, for anesthesia, the types of questions in terms of COVID is that probably they're going to continue to be people who have COVID. Um, and so how do you be able to detect it, especially when it's hopefully less common will be the issue. Where does the virus spread? You know, how can it spread? We, we, that's very poorly understood at this point. And um, so these are the types of questions. But I, I don't know enough in terms of people after having COVID. What is an aspect of anesthesiology that you would want to change or you don't really particularly enjoy and you think there could be some amendments? Um. Well, I, I, I don't, let me sort of in terms of what are features that the things that I try to work on in terms of changing and so forth. Um, I think that it can be hard. One of the things would be is that for many people, because it is a field where it does involve um, 24 hour type work. And in addition, when you're taking care of patients, it's not that you can stop and pause. And so it is difficult in terms of when things involving families and so forth come up. Um, it, it, it's, it's hard. And so how to be able to create a, be, a better environment to be able to sustain careers on a long-term basis is important. So that would be one thing. Um, 
the other thing, which is one of the features about the field is that again, these are tasks in which you don't stop in the middle. You don't, for example, stop, you know, a surgery while they're like, you know, operating on the heart. But the reason that's very important is that there's a lot of actual downtime in anesthesia. What I mean by that is that you're way, you know, you, you thought you would be working on a given day and they're not patients to take care of. And the reason how they're related is that you, when you're scheduling something, if you were to have, for example, appointments, imagine you have, you have something you, you can do and you begin to work on it, begin to work on it. And you say, well, the time is up. I'm going to do is now uh, switch stop and I'm going to restart the next day. It's possible to basically pack your time to fill, fill up all your time. The fact that you can stop a task in the middle means that you can make sure you have a lot of time very well filled. Um, there are other things that you can't stop in the middle, but you can also basically make sure you can fill up all the time. And that's as if you know exactly how long something is going to take. So if you know that something's going to take exactly five hours, not a minute more or a minute less, you can still basically plan mathematically in sophisticated ways so you fill up all your time. But anesthesia, that's not true. And in fact, what productivity means is the amount of production that each person does. It's actually surprisingly low. And again, the reason is fundamentally because these are things that you can't stop in the middle, but which you also have a lot of unpredictability, variability in how long they take. And how to be able to increase the productivity in anesthesia is really important from a societal point of view because it's expensive. When people ask in terms of you have very expensive years of training, you have a lot of people involved. And the thing about it is it's not that they're working at a constant amount. Okay, There's a lot of time in which you still have to pay them because they planned on being there, but they're not take patients available to take care of at the time. So how to be able to increase the productivity of anesthesia is very important. You can think in terms of why are healthcare costs very high, so to speak. From the point of view of um, the whole process of patients having surgery, a lot of the reason is for this reason, anesthesia. This is the dominant reason that there are extra costs. And how to be, and it's fundamental, but how to be able to improve upon that is very important for the specialty and for healthcare. Thank you for that insight. Um, I think that something else that maybe you could give us some, or you can talk about your experience on would be um, how you've seen technology, maybe specifically in the field of anesthesia, kind of develop over the years as you've been a part of the specialty. Um, just in terms of, like you said, you were talking about um, going to the NSF computer labs and now um, college students, we are actually all taking classes on our computers right now. Like we don't have um, that kind of, um, we don't have that in-person interaction right now, but how have you seen the way technology is involved and what do you think has been like the pros and the cons of that? I can't think of any cons, uh, hardly any cons. I, I would just say pros. Okay, so in terms of technology, things that are amazing. Um, so ultrasound in anesthesia, when people are doing the nerve blocks, they can see where they're going. You see the needle, you see the nerves and so forth. It's amazing. Um, the idea that when you're trying to put a needle into an artery or something like that, you can see it, you can make sure you're going to the right place. So that is from computing power is what it is. It, you know, basically the micro basically just so much faster in terms of the amount of memory and amount of speed to make that possible. It's amazing. When you are, for example, putting in a breathing tube and so forth, you have these video scopes and so forth. And so there are many patients which it's very hard to see and the video scopes, again, you have the imaging and so forth. So these the tools are just amazing as possible. Um, for myself, it really is the, the level of the advance in terms of computers, it's the memory. So just in terms of, you, you know, you think in terms of nowadays gigabytes and stuff like that. So, you know, we got work done. I mean, I studied, for example, the spread of pollen, you know, basically spread of pollen and stuff like that. The total amount of memory I was able by apply, I had to apply, I do written applications and stuff like that. I had one megabyte. Okay, so not a gigabyte, I had one megabyte. And that included all the storage total and the operating system, okay? So that's 
everything. And that was amazing. I mean, people would work with half a megabyte. That would be the operating system, all your data, the computer programs and so forth. And we got work done back then. So I think that the, the thing is that the ability to be able to handle this is so amazing what can be done um, because you're able to work so much more quickly and practically and stuff like that. And I think that that's just fantastic. Um, and the other thing is just one of the things is that even the sad things, for example, with the pandemic is, but the idea in terms of video, because I mentioned how anesthesia is very uh, social, the research is very social around the world. The idea that um, in order for me to basically work with a, a statistician in Sweden, we can just do it by Zoom. I don't have to go there. And in the past, really, in order to get to know somebody sufficiently to trust each other, to work together, you really would kind of go there. And it's such a savings in terms of time and the ability to be able to get more done. So I think that really the computing is, is very, very key um, that's occurred over the period of my, time, my career. Thank you. Can you talk more about your mathematics background and how useful it is in your clinical research? I, I use it every single day. So um, I don't do anything um, with calculus. Um, so um, there was a period a few weeks, a months ago where I actually had to like do an integral. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm like the integral. So um, I don't use calculus at all. Um, but what I do do is, is um, um, oh, there's, oh, there's a, I'm hearing an echo. Okay, it's gone. Um, so uh, the type of work uh, fundamentally that I'm kind of good at, what I learned starting college is a, what's called statistical numerical analysis. So the idea is how do you write a computer program to get a correct answer when the whole reason is that nobody knows what the answer is? And there's a lot of people where that is the type of work you have to do. I mean, you're designing something and nobody's ever designed it. So how do you know that it's correct when, you know, there's just not, for example, you're trying to put like, uh, like a square on, a, you know, on the screen. And maybe it's hard to put a square on the screen, but you know when you put the square on the screen. That's not what I'm doing. A lot of it is I'm trying to figure out what is a correct answer to a question that nobody's ever solved before. So how do you write programs and how do you process these to be able to assure that it's the correct answer? So, um, I'm very good basically in terms of dealing with probabilities, uncertainty and things like that. You have to learn a breadth of different statistical tests and how to apply it and also how to describe it to different type, different people. And the software for doing statistical type analyses have gotten just so much better over the decades. I know when I was applying to um, graduate schools, people told me that there was really no potential growth in statistics, actually, that the thing was that they had kind of done what could be done, and that in the future, basically, people would just click a mouse or something like that. And think ever since then, for example, there's been the finance industry bloomed and so forth. And this is because of basically the ability to use with faster computers, basically novel types of algorithms and so forth. Um, I'm sorry, did I, hopefully that answered the question. It did, thank you. Yeah, I think did. having a, a foundation in statistics is really important. Even while reading um, uh, journals and studies and peer reviewed, like articles, uh, you making sure that this is reliable and relevant. I think so, but I think also that people who are interested in terms of thinking of pre-health and at the same time are kind of like solving math type questions, think of the word problem. The real world is word problems. That's what it is. I solve word problems. And my, when I teach, it's just word problem, word problem. Biostatistics is such a great field the ability to basically design clinical trials. And you can see how important it is to be able to make clinical trials faster, to be shorter with fewer patients and stuff like that with the pandemic. The idea to be able to look at the spread of diseases, for example, or to identify people asked about the symptoms, for example, of COVID. All of this is the breadth of what people do in statistics. And the opportunity to interact in so many different fields, whether you're doing statistics for machine learning, let's say with Google, or for example, ordering type things, statistics 
and inventory management, whether you know giant companies like Amazon. It's just incredible what you can do. So these are great fields and all of these interact in terms of healthcare. Thank you. Um, so this is kind of shifting topics a little bit. Um, what do you think is the most under, important underlying skill to learn at maybe an early age that will help you, that you think um, helps students most um, in medical schools and residencies and then just like applying things to the field? Yeah, but I don't think I have a great answer. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, but I will say that um, at, at least for myself is that um, people talk about you know I mentioned made the comment about how I learned that first time in graduate school when I started that I got to go to the supercomputer center and I got to look at these like adults and I learned that they just worked. I, I guess if I had to pick any one thing, it would be is work. In other words, that, it, you know, is it really like the hours, so to speak? Is it really kind of sticking with it and so forth? Yes. At least for what I do, yes, it's what it is. Um, and people are just motivated and they work really hard. And there is something that that, that isn't to be reduced. It, it's the reality of the situation, at least for what I type of stuff I do. And that's what I learned. Yeah. There was a student asking, um, what advice do you have on making the most out of your medical education, undergraduate education? Did you join any clubs, organizations? How did you like really take a lot um, out of your time in undergrad and medical school? Um, well, in terms of with um, undergrad and stuff like that, when I wasn't in classes and stuff like that, I was doing research. And um, the thing was, it wasn't, you know, understand uh, part of the research in retrospect was it was in teams. So in other words, that I was kind of learning how to apply um, statistics and math for solving biology problems. And I got to work with other graduate students. And in retrospect, what I learned was how to stick with a project was one. So it matter like the work hours, stick with the project. The second thing is I learned skills in terms of how to do this type of computer program when you don't have the answer. But the other thing was the importance of working in a team, that you rely on other people and how to break up problems into pieces, how to ask questions of other people and so forth, and to trust other people in terms of helping out in terms of solving problems. So I think that I got that. And then in terms of, uh, I would say med school and graduate school, probably the same types of things. Um, is kind of what I learned and so forth. But again, understand that I went into anesthesia, which is a very team activity. The research I do is a very team activity. And then you can hear myself talking about college in terms of working in part of teams. So it is very much in terms of how do you work in terms of teams, in terms of solving problems. Um, thank you. So another question we had was, what advice do you have persons who might be unsure about what specialty or field they want to go into? Um, maybe especially from your experience and how you kind of tailored your interests of math and statistics into finding kind of your niche in medicine. I think that I would, if, um, when I was in college, I had never thought in terms of First of all, yes, biostatistics has broadened tremendously, and I probably would have found out about it. But it might have been that I just was too limited in thinking about it in terms of other ways of doing healthcare. But you know, I think that think about not only in terms of so many. One thing which is so nice is that so many of people I met ahead and looking at the interests are not just medical school, for example, or. Think about all the different ways. Nurse anesthesia, for example, in terms of my field, is such a great field. You know, in terms of going into nursing, if you like critical care nursing, you become a nurse anesthetist. To think about ways in terms of things that are um, master's degree programs in terms of healthcare and so forth. And I think in terms of biomedical engineering, all these aspects that go into healthcare. So I think there are so many different routes um, to take. And I think about thinking it very broadly makes a lot of sense. And especially for people who want to take care of patients, 
um, to really think in terms of things like nursing and to think about things, basically physician assistant type things, which is anesthesiology assistant, physician's assistant, and so forth. A student asked if you had any favorite classes or teachers in undergrad or medical school that you really liked learning. I don't think I remember all that much in medical school. I remember classes in terms of graduate school. And so one of the things was uh, most of what I remember, unfortunately, maybe it's good or bad, are like lessons that seem unrelated to the teaching. So in, when I chose, for example, I think the graduate school still relates to college and, and stuff. Um, I used to try to take courses by people who were actually doing it. In other words, they weren't just te they were teaching, but also so like in graduate school, they were people work for NASA. And even though it had nothing to do with healthcare, the thing was that if they were involved, like in the space shuttle, well, and they're teaching about how they apply math and stuff like that, space shuttle up, they, they know how it works. And one of the things was to be lessons about how you'd have very, one of the things he, this person taught me was that when you're trying to improve workflow and management and so forth, he said is that if you have an improvement when you can find that's more than 10%, you probably shouldn't try to improve it because anybody can improve something by more than 10, by, if you could improve something right away by 10% or more, the chances are there's a reason why there's a lot of slack in it. In other words, everybody can find a way of optimizing something if there's like 10% extra time or 15% extra time in something. There might be a reason why it's there. So if you think, for example, about let's say power plants right now in Texas, okay? You might have extra capacity. You have the ability to handle, for example, temperature, cold temperatures and things like that. You can reduce costs, but the problem is that there's a reason why you want to have extra capacity and so forth. And so I learned kind of the lesson in terms of that sometimes the lessons you get from things can be quite different, you know, than um, where it's from. I know that when I look at the types of projects that I've had the opportunity to do in my career, a lot has been from where one, for example, um, just emailing people. So one wonderful thing was um, in my own course, uh, somebody had taught basically, um, I teach people how to work in teams. And um, I have some math questions that people answer. And the math questions are things which is obviously right and wrong. Basically, it's, the math is no different than what you do in ninth grade in high school, ninth or 10th grade in high school. And yet some people who are very experienced clinicians basically called me over and they said they want to let me know that um, it would be, I'm going to give it, I'm not saying it's like X plus two equals five. Okay. But it would be sort of like a quadratic equation, like X squared, you know, plus, you know, one equals five. It's something which there is a correct answer. There are two correct answers to that situation. They wanted to let me know that um, they thought it was really bothersome that I didn't value their opinion. I'm like, what do you mean value opinion? I mean, the answer is, you know, you know, X equals one or X. There, there are two answers here. There's one answer. That's it. It's right, wrong. But you know, we have different outlooks towards the problem. And we talked about it, I'm thinking like, what are they talking about? But from that, I began to read and I learned about communication scientists who study things about how do engine, basically people work in organizations where if an engineer is trying to explain to people in a company that their plan, the reason no other company's ever done is it violates the laws of physics. And the engineer is trying to say basically, well, I know why nobody's ever done this product. It violates the laws of physics. And yet like marketing people are like, you have a bad attitude, you have a negative attitude. And so these communication scientists have studied these processes. And then I was able to work with these, basically I just emailed them, I emailed one of the communication scientists. And you know, we began a collaboration over many years. And I think that reaching out to people you know, again, it's creating new teams is really, really good. I know that in thinking about undergraduate is that the advice that I got from, I had mentioned in the beginning, it was a, a geologist who studied the fossilized pollen, who said the important thing is not so much trying to pretend that you know what you're going to do, but it's working on problems. It's learning how to solve problems. And he was right. 
it was basically sort of like, don't worry about the details of what you're going to be working in. If you're interested in research, learn how to solve problems and do it. And I think that that was really good advice. I think he probably would have also said is learn how to solve problems. You know, you're going to be doing these types of math and engineering problems. Learn how to work in a team, to rely on other people to solve these problems, to coordinate projects. So I think that a lot of classes nowadays are probably a lot better of assigning projects where people have to work together. And it is hard. It's really hard to divide up the work and get things accomplished. You have to learn how to do it. So I think that those, those things were very good. And I would ask people, you know, in college about doing research projects. And I, again, had the opportunity in terms of like writing papers and things like that. So I think that that, that is very good and important. Thank you. Um, and I guess another question that maybe we could um, talk about is how have you seen maybe um, the diversity and the fact of maybe different people in your field and how might you, uh, and over the past couple of years as you've been practicing, and then also um, what do you think maybe could be done to enhance that or get people more involved in anesthesia? Yeah, so um, there has been such an increase mostly in is women so in, I know that, for example, when um, I was in graduate school, there was, as I only remember one woman. Um, so, um, and so more or less, let's assume there were most, I, I think classes might have been like one woman and maybe 19 or 20 guys. And now in biostatistics and engineering and stuff like that, it's majority women. So most of the people I work with happen to be more than half are women right now. It's a dramatic change over time. So that has kind of happened and stuff like that. Um, I think it's very challenging um, in terms of, one thing is, so I work for the University of Iowa and it's very hard for us to, um, in terms of recruiting, you know, more minorities and stuff like that. Part of it is that, you know, people don't want to move to Iowa. That's one thing. But the other thing is that anesthesiology is sort of at the end of a long process in terms of, you know, there's college, there's medical school, people are interested in going into academics and, and so forth. And um, I, I don't really know, you know, what to do. One of the challenges, for example, that we talk a lot about, I always know is hard, is um, jobs for partners and spouses. You know, that that's really one of the things. And then I explained to you that in terms of my life, I don't take care of patients because I couldn't find a job in the same city as my wife. And I just hated it. Um, so, I mean, I really thought that we, you know, we were doing everything we could to try to balance our lives together and stuff. And it, I thought, you know, wow, two doctors, I mean, I thought it'd be straightforward and we just failed um, and I gave up. So I, I do think, I mean, I love, I love my job. I love my career. My wife is so happy with what she's doing. I mean, I just think it's great. And now I look in terms of the pandemic, um, she's been taking care of many, many COVID patients. And, you know, we talk about it quite often and think about, you know, would we have changed, you know, our careers and things like that? And the answer is no. You know, knowing now, seeing what's happened over decades, we, we made great choices but it was very different than what we could. And it's very difficult sometimes to try to find jobs, at least for us in the same city. So that's had a big effect. And that has a big effect for us recruiting people to the University of Iowa. So I think that one of the things that I hope is that if there's any upside of 500,000 people dying, I, I just can't even imagine the numbers. And it's just so amazing, sad is that if people can continue to work remotely, I think that that will help so much. You, you can't in, take care of, do anesthesia remotely and stuff like that, but I think progressively organizations will let people work you know, more in different places and so forth. And I think that that's really, really important in terms of helping in terms of diversity and things like that. And for people as they're thinking about different types of healthcare, to think about the idea that the types of jobs that can make it easier in terms of, you know, balance of um, family life and work life 
is those aspects that are those that are the remote aspects. That's an advantage of biostatistics, for example. It's entirely done remotely. That's a tremendous plus because you're with a spouse or a partner or something like that. And if their job has to move, you can move and continue to work for the same organization. And that's a wonderful aspect of it. So I would say that that I hope, I hope that the organizations continue to have people working remotely in the future, because I think that that will help a lot, at least in my field. Thank you so much. As a final question, we have students who are studying um, and focusing their experiences and education around computer science and business management. Um, which field of medicine or uh, any health field do you think they can contribute more? Oh, I definitely don't think, I wouldn't want to say contribute more to one or the other, but I think there are a lot of areas. So first of all, one of the things is there is these masters in health management and policy. So for example, the University of Iowa program, it's amazing to become hospital administrators and things like that. So that would be one area. And these health management and policy programs, they're in colleges of public health. Um, that would be kind of one of the aspects. The other is in terms of industrial engineering and hospital engineering. So um, people basically have kind of more of focus in terms of process flow. The other thing is to think about when you think of healthcare is to think very broadly, not only working in hospitals and with patients, but also, for example, supplies. So if you think of the pandemic, you know, hospitals are part of integrated systems and this idea of where do supplies come from, how do they move in the country and so forth, that's healthcare too. And more and more, for example, for surgery, where people get the, the surgical trays and all the equipment and things like that. They are keep those facilities physically separate from the hospitals for a number of reasons. The movement of the supplies and so forth, that's healthcare. It even, in other words, and it's just as, when I say just as important, you can't take care of patients if you don't have the supplies and so forth. I think in terms of computer so, science, the, the idea of artificial intelligence, these technologies to help for radiology with the images, for pathology and so forth. Those things are very important. Language translation. These tools are amazing and that is healthcare. That is part of healthcare and so forth. So I think that the in terms of the business applications, um, somebody who's interested in computer science, definitely whether you work, for example, in terms of uh, you know, graduate school in terms of engineering, that makes sense whether you go to work for firms that work in radiology and imaging and so forth, think about electronic medical records and the whole idea of how do you use your electronic medical records to provide better care and how important it is, for example, in a situation of pandemic in terms of disasters and so forth, that people can have their medical records anywhere. That's healthcare. So I think that one of the things is always to be thinking about it, that healthcare is not only the people who take care of patients directly, it is the people who do the business type things to keep it running. And lowering the cost of healthcare is so important because it's not that an economy can sustain constant increases in it. It's not that there's money that just comes from places. And so how to be able to find ways to reduce unnecessary care is so important. And that's thing that administrators contribute to doing. Thank you so much for your presentation today and answering all of our questions. Um, it was wonderful. And believe it or not, we still had a ton of other questions in the chat that we had, you know, on the time to get to. But um, if there is a way that you would be willing to have students contact you if they have other questions. Um, I'm Definitely. Not sure. Should um here let me do is I'm gonna put it put in the chat for example I'm gonna put a website okay it would help if I type so it's my name okay I guess you can see my name Franklin Dexter so if you go to franklindexter.net franklindexter.com it doesn't matter you also can just go to Google and say like University of Iowa Franklin Dexter Franklin Dexter anesthesiology pretty much it'll come up. And there's a contact me button there and you can look at that. And one of the other things is that um, there was a thing where um, my university wanted me to put together, it's at the end of my, at the contact me, there's a, my curriculum vitae, my like list of stuff I've done. 
But at the end, they asked me to put together a summary of this is what I've done during my career. And if you want to sort of see how the disparate ways of all the different types of things you can do within a specialty with math and statistics or something like that, or how a career develops, I mean, I had to do it. It's there. Uh, it took a lot of time. Somebody might find it interesting. But anyway, if you want to interest in terms of these types of things in anesthesia, francodexter.net, francodexter.com, that'll get you there. Thank you so much. Um, that was a really wonderful presentation, and I appreciate you being open to connecting with students after this. Oh, um, absolutely. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share our wrap up presentation, but thank you so much. You don't have to stick around anymore if you don't want to, but I really enjoyed your presentation today, and I personally learned a lot. Great. Have a nice evening. Thank you very much. You too. Okay, for my students. Um, we're going to go over a quick wrap up presentation to let you know how you can get your certificate to verify your virtual shadowing hours today. Um, thank you all for joining us. So um, a couple of things we would like to ask you to reflect on. Um, so what brought you to the session today? What are three major takeaways that you got and what do you want to learn more about? Um, these aren't required. You don't need to write anything or submit anything, but um, we always like to hear from our students and we always like to encourage thinking about how we can grow and learn from these sessions. So if you do happen to type something up, um, you can definitely submit it to us at prehealthshadowing.com slash blog submissions. And our editor in chief, who is in Taha, our wonderful co-host today, um, can definitely give you some feedback, check that out, and you can do, do some writing for her. It's again, great for CVs, applications, and resumes. So I encourage you to submit. Um, we are also um, accepting new team member applications if you are interested in being up here with us and being a part of the team. Or you can, if you don't have as much time, you can be a volunteer and work asynchronously, do tasks from home, and also meet other students and network and connect, as well as have opportunities to um, do professional outreach, grant writing, um, diversity work. It's a great opportunity. I'd love to you guys and get to know you more and get involved. So if you'd like to uh, visit us at prehealthshadowing.com and sign up today. So once again, we humbly ask that if you are financially able to, that you donate and please consider sending us a few dollars via Venmo or PayPal. Um, it, it of course helps us keep our program running and since it costs a lot, but we still want to keep it free to everybody. So if you can, please donate. If you know somebody else who can, please send it to them. But we just want to keep this going so everybody has access to the education they deserve. So now what we have all been waiting for, um, we are going to earn our virtual shadowing certificates for attending the session today. So the first thing you're going to do is go onto our website and find Dr. Dexter's professional page. Um, you can next, you're going to click take this course, and then you can start a quick 10 question multiple choice quiz that's based entirely on the contents in this session. Um, and you will have 30 minutes per attempt to earn a 70% chance, 70% or higher in order to earn your certificate. Um, we do know that our website has had some difficulties. It's been a little bit slow with the amount of traffic that we're getting on it right now. So I would recommend waiting 30 minutes to half an hour to after the session ends in order to go take it. Um, but if you do have any difficulties that come up, we have given you two attempts to um, accommodate this. Um, otherwise, please email us at info at freehousestuttering.com and we can help you out. But once you've taken the quiz, once you've passed that, then you can go ahead and click finish course and download your free certificate. If you ever need to go back and access and see all of your certificates, you can go to your profile at the top of the page and then scroll over to the um, Taking Courses tab and see all of the PDFs out there for you. If you missed a part of our session today or want to go back and view other virtual shadowing sessions or other certificates, um, you can go to our YouTube channel or you can find our previously recorded sessions on uh, the professional pages on our website. Um, I highly encourage you to go back and look through these. We've had over 50 sessions in the past. Um, from people of all different specialties, doctors, nurses, um, dentists, prosthodontists, vets, PAs, um, PhDs, 
MD holders. So it's it's really wonderful to have the chance to be exposed to a ton of different specialties. If you're unsure of where you're going, or even if you do know exactly where you're going, um, maybe you can find somebody of the specialty of interest on there. So I encourage you to go back and you have you can take the post shadowing assessments for these as well as from our website as they are open indefinitely and just back up those on those uh, virtual shadowing hours. So be sure to follow us on social media and um, sign up for our email list at virtualshadowing.com in order to stay up to date on all of our sessions. It's really exciting because we have virtual shadowing sessions booked every weekday through June. So we are going to have the opportunity to hear from a wonderful variety of professionals. And it's, I hope to see you guys there. So definitely check it out and you can go ahead and register for the sessions today. So I'd like to thank you all again for joining us. Um, and if you have any questions, um, feel free to stick around. I'll be here with some of my team members and we are happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, but that is it. Our virtual shadowing session is officially over and I hope you all have a wonderful night.